Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Hello, good morning and welcome back. We are glad to have you with us again on this, the first Sunday after the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in 2020. We're excited to be with you and we have an exciting word and message from God just for you. How are you going to hear God today? Are you gonna stay seated? Are you gonna take notes? Or are you going to walk around and get your praise on? Make a decision because God has a word for you. Our wonderful word from God comes this morning, once again, from the gospel given to the author of St. John. John's gospel, chapter 20, once again. And this day, we are going to the 26th verse. If you would be careful and kind, and make your way to John's Gospel, the 26th verse, and we will start there in chapter 20. Chapter 20, verse number 26. When you have it, just say, I got it, Pastor, or say, let's ride. Hear the word of the Lord on this day. Eight days later, Jesus' disciples were sitting inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, you have believed because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. This morning, I invite you to join me in hearing a word from the Lord. And that word from the Lord is simple. Building our faith after the resurrection. Building our faith after the resurrection. It's the Sunday after resurrection, and so much has changed for the community of faith called the disciples. We celebrated virtually last week, yet we still celebrate it. He has risen was the theme, and everyone throughout the land and throughout history know that song, He Has Risen. Brothers and sisters, on this Sunday, we come together after the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and after the power of the testimony of the disciples has gone forward. Eight days later, we are back in the same place gathering and we have one question. How do we build our faith after the resurrection? You see, in the early morning, when the disciples gathered once again, we must remember that they were just as afraid as we would have been. They had lynched Jesus, that's right. They didn't just crucify him, they lynched him. They'd taken their leader, they'd placed him in the hands of a court, they'd given him trumped up charges, they convicted him, and they had executed him through a lynch mob. And the disciples, whether you know it or not, were afraid the same thing was going to happen to them. Brothers and sisters, don't be so hard on the disciples this morning. They were just like we would have been. They crucified, lynched their leader, and they were afraid the lynching was coming for them next. We have known the history of lynching in America, and we know that if it happens to one of our persons or friends that we care deeply for, it is possible that it can also happen to us. So the disciples were gathered together in some scripture, they say, in some versions of the gospel, they say they were gathered in the upper room. But John's gospel takes the time to just say, eight days after the resurrection of Jesus, they were gathered in a room, in a home. They were gathered there wondering, trying to figure out how they were going to put their lives back together again. After their leader had been killed, after their leader had supposedly 
resurrected. They hadn't seen him yet. Many of them had not, at least Thomas had not. And they were wondering, how are we going to build our faith? Brothers and sisters, in this season of carnivore, we need to be aware that it's important that after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we still build our faith. How do we build our faith? I want you to understand that the message of John's gospel has a special word for you. How do you build your faith after the resurrection? Most of us, if we tell the truth, we've got what we call a spiritual hangover. A spiritual hangover is when you, well, I don't need to explain it to you. You know what a hangover is. Just consider it spiritual hangover. You've had the greatest high in your spiritual life. You've celebrated that Jesus has been resurrected. Everything the Christian calendar and faith is built upon has just taken place. So what could be next? Nothing but a hangover. How do you survive when you feel you've had your greatest high? How do you come back after experiencing the spiritual high that God has delivered you from? Watch this, after you've danced your dance, after you've shouted your shout, after you've opened the door of a new job, after you've seen your children delivered, after you've seen the relationship put back together, after God has healed your spouse, healed your mother, healed your father, after God has delivered your brother or your sister, how do you respond? The deliverance, the freedom, the healing, the new opportunity is not all God has for you. You've got to build your faith after the resurrection. And today God calls us to a period uh, in scripture where it's necessary we look at how we'll build our faith after the wonderful resurrection of God moving in your life. It says, the scripture says that the disciples were gathered together and the room, but guess what? Thomas was with them this time. And as Thomas is with them, it says that the doors were locked, but Jesus showed up. The first thing I want you to know that we need to do to build our faith after the resurrection is simply brothers and sisters, we've got to have the courage to remain re relational. We've got to remain relational. The faith that we're a part of is a relational faith. Believe it or not, in spite of what we preach on Sunday, in spite of what we do as a habit throughout the year, many of those of us who have been Baptist, Methodist, African Methodist, AME Zion, Presbyterian, you name it, even the non-denominational experience, we have a what I call a code of conduct that we behave like in the sanctuary. We know that there are certain things we do on Sunday morning. We have certain creeds we recite. Everybody in the Methodist faith knows what all things come of thee, O Lord, means. Everybody in the Methodist faith knows this word, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Everybody in the Methodist faith understands the word, the Apostles' Creed. Everybody in the Baptist faith understands this phrase, one Lord, one baptism, and one God. Everybody in certain faith group has what we call a particular habit that the religious body establishes for them. Brothers and sisters, there comes a moment in our religious habits that we miss something that's more important than just reciting the creed, just learning the Apostles' Creed, just having a chance to come together and say all things come of thee. There is something more important than that, and that is that we remain in our faith relational. Believe it or not, Christianity is not a creed faith, it's a relational faith. That means that relationships are more important than the creeds that we recite. Believe it or not, in spite of our denominational affiliation, what really makes our denomination important is not the creed, it's the fact that we are relational. We get together, we talk with one another, we have an opportunity to join together in faith relationally and share that faith with others. Right now, our habit of relational has changed. We can't come together and one body in a sanctuary, but we still can be relational. The disciples had their life transformed and changed. They were used to walking with the fellow named Jesus. They were used to talking with him and having an opportunity to eat with him and to dialogue with him in the flesh. But that was about to change. 
How in the world are they going to make it when everything they used to do is no longer available to them? And that's a question we need to ask ourselves right now. How are we going to build our faith when things are different because of the culture and the climate of the culture that's taking place? We've got to remain relational family. We've got to stay connected to one another in unique and available ways. If we remain relational, I can promise you we are holding up the same message that the gospel writer John has for us. You do understand that in the gospel of John, everything is about relationship. Even the resurrection itself is about relationship. What? I thought it was about salvation. Hold on. Salvation and eternal life is a part of John's message. But John is really interested in developing our faith to know that our relationship with God exudes even beyond death. That's right. Jesus is illustrating that my relationship with you cannot be stopped by death. And right now, someone needs to join me in celebrating the fact that our relationship with God can work beyond the grave. There are some of us right now that figured that the relationship we had with our loved one ended because they died. But I've come to announce to you that you can have a relationship beyond the death or grave with your loved one. How? God God has shown us through Jesus Christ that death cannot stop our relationship with God. And I want to shout right there because somebody needs to know that sin, that death, and that principalities of wickedness and high places cannot stop God from reaching out to you. One of my favorite artists, Marvin Gaye, had a song with Tammy Terrell back in the day that said, ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough to keep me from you. God has that ability to climb mountains, to get through valleys, just to walk with us. We've got to remain relational. The disciples are remaining relational. Relational. They stay in touch with one another and the word says they were together in a room. You can be in a room with someone, not physically right now, but you can be with them through technological advancement. You can use different instruments to provide the sight and sounds of a relationship. And every now and then, all we really need is someone to know that they are with us, is that someone has to help us understand that we are not in the midst of this pandemic by ourselves. Relations can help with that. The disciples remain relational in spite of what they're going through. They reach out to one another, they hold one another, they help one another, and they are together. How are we gonna build our faith right now? Being relational. It's interesting that while they are being relational, it introduces them to fellowship. You know, there's nothing like fellowship. There's nothing like partnering with people and walking with them. The old hymn writer says, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. There's nothing like walking with people through difficult and dangerous times. We've got to remain relational, not only with our family, but also our community in faith. We're working hard now, pastors and church leaders across the world are working hard to remain relational with people that we are feeding and sharing spiritually. People, we just want you to know you are not by yourself. And the disciples show us the way by remaining relational and it leads to good fellowship. I don't know about you, but I know when I've had some good fellowship. I know when I've been in the presence of people, whether it's been on the phone or in the physical presence of someone, and it's blessed my life. Some of the best conversations I have had have not been in person, but they've been over a telephone. They've been over a Zoom session. Some of the most impactful moments in my life are treasured not by the walking in physical touch, but family, by sitting and listening through a phone or a Zoom message. Listen, God has opened the door for us to have moments of fellowship in unique and unusual ways. And the word says they were together. Listen, you can be together with someone and not be in person. You got to get over yourself. 
You got to get over how it used to be. And you got to embrace what God is making available to you right now. We can remain relational even in the midst of this pandemic. Secondly, brothers and sisters, what's so powerful about this is that God in the Holy Word shows us that there's another way we can build our faith after the resurrection. We can build our faith after the resurrection first by what? Remaining relational. Secondly, beloved, we build our faith, and here it is, by removing our roadblocks. What? Roadblocks? In the scripture, if you read it, if you look at it even now, it says that they were where? In a room and the doors were closed, but Jesus walked in. I wanna be specific and share with you that often when a pandemic hits, the first thing we do is shut people out. Often when a spiritual pandemic hits, what we begin to do is close ranks and keep people out. What I wanna share with you is that the disciples are no different than we are. The resurrection took place, but they're still afraid and they've closed ranks. There are no strangers that are in the room. The disciples are in the room and they've done something. They've set up a roadblock. We cannot build our faith until we remove our roadblocks. Can I testify? that often when spiritual trauma hits our life, we close down everyone. We won't answer phones. We won't respond to messages. We just let people hear the phone ring and we look down at it and we don't feel or have the strength to even answer or talk with them. Part of the reason we do that is because we don't feel like reliving the experience. And some people, they don't know how to be a friend. They call and they want you to go over and over and over what you've already gone through and it's like reliving it. So if you're listening to me and you know someone is going through something and you choose to reach out to them, be careful that you don't ask them what happened. Be careful that you don't take the time to make them relive the story of telling you this situation over and over again. My brother, my sister, Ask them if they feel like talking about it, and if they don't, leave it alone. The disciples have set up roadblocks that will keep Jesus from getting in just like anybody else. They've closed the door, and I've come to announce that when we experience spiritual trauma, when we experience heartache and heartbreak, watch this, because of a broken relationship, and that's exactly what's happening in the text. The disciples have experienced a broken relationship. How? Jesus is not with them. They've seen him. He's been broken, he's been beaten, and he's been lynched, and he is not present. And since this has taken place, beloved, they haven't been able to connect with him. But I've come to announce today that in the midst of him not being present and them experiencing spiritual trauma, they've shut the doors, they've closed people out, and we do the same. How do we build our faith after the resurrection if we closed and set up roadblocks? Can I ask a question? When you've experienced trauma in your life, have you not closed the door on someone? Have you not shut down and not allowed people to be present with you or for you? Right now, in the midst of this pandemic, we've been told we need to be careful how we engage. And some of us have completely shut down. And I've come to announce to you, our faith is built after the resurrection by removing the roadblock. Do you realize that every miracle that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John is done because roadblocks have been removed? Let me call the roll. In the second chapter of John's Gospel, the wedding in Cana was possible with wine because of what? A roadblock was moved. Jesus had to take the empty jars and pull them together and utilize them even though they were for a different ceremony. You've got to remove roadblocks in order for the Lord to bring some things into your life. Some of us have attempted to protect ourselves from hurt and harm again by setting up roadblocks. But roadblocks don't work. Roadblocks keep God out and don't allow Jesus to work his perfect will in your life. 
We've got to remove the roadblocks in our life. I've got to ask a question. How many of you listening or watching have actually placed roadblocks up to keep you from being hurt again. I've come today to tell you to remove your roadblock. The disciples have closed the doors, have locked out the possibility of Jesus coming inside. But I want you to know that if you would remove your roadblock, whatever it might be, God through Christ Jesus can build your faith. The word says that Jesus comes in in spite of the roadblock. He comes in in spite of the doors being closed. And I want to take a moment. Jesus is not a ghost. At this moment, he's still a human. He is not a ghost. He walks into the room, which means he opens the doors. I want to tell you something hermeneutically you may not understand that the Lord Jesus has the key to get into every locked door in your life. You cannot lock Jesus Christ out of your life. He will get in because he has the, uh, the master key. I want to remind you today that when you thought you closed the door on God, God through Christ Jesus opened it, not because you intended it to, but because God has the master key. I want you to remove the roadblock, not just the key, not just the locked door, but there are other roadblocks that we have in life. Some of us, when we are hurt, here's what we do. I'm not going back anymore. Some of us, when we are offended, here's what we do. We never look to return to the place that has committed the offense against us. Now, I've been a pastor for quite some time. I've been in ministry for 25 years. I've seen enough to know that church members who call themselves Christians often put up roadblocks when they've been hindered and hurt and experience spiritual trauma inside the walls of the church. They refuse to return. Here's my favorite, I can't give because they will misuse my money. Well, I want you to understand this. It ain't yours in the first place. And when you place it in the hands of God, it leaves your control and it's really in the hands of God. And if persons misuse, abuse, or misappropriate your funds, wait a minute, God's funds, then that is in the hands of God and that individual and you cannot claim on your judgment day that someone else kept you from doing what you were supposed to do with what God had blessed you with. That wasn't in the sermon. That was just to help somebody who's struggling right now with whether you are going to keep a roadblock up or whether you're going to remove the roadblock and let the Lord use you for his kingdom and let the Lord use you for the glory of God, you've got to remove that roadblock, brother. You've got to remove that roadblock, sister. You cannot in this moment allow what has happened to you in the past to dictate how you will let God use you in the future. How ridiculous does that sound? You would allow what happened to you in the past, watch this, that God brought you through, that God delivered you from, that God made a way through, that God overcame with you, you're going to allow something that was meant to break you, keep you from being blessed and being a blessing. How ludicrous is that? Let God have God's way in your life right now. Preach pastor, I think I am. The text says that Jesus came in even though the door was closed and guess what he does? He actually goes directly to the one who was missing in the first place. Other disciples were around the scene family, but Jesus goes to the one that has experienced the spiritual trauma. I know you think God has forgotten about your spiritual heartbreak. I know you think God has forgotten about how you were done wrong by the church and those who were in the church. I know you think that God has forgotten how your job mistreated you, how your job overlooked you, how your your job mismanaged you, how your family abused you, how your spouse continues to walk over you. I know you think God has forgotten how your children have just taken advantage of your love and affection. I know you wonder if God has forgotten. No. 
building our faith after the resurrection is happening because we remove roadblocks and can I shout you because God has not forgotten your pain that's a word for somebody right now that God has not forgotten your pain that God has not forgotten the nights you stayed up crying that God has not forgotten the days you walked the floor at your job to keep from breaking down that God has not forgotten the many nights that you walked the floors looking around to find what is called peace from God God has not forgotten how you tossed and turned and how your pillow has been wet with tears God has not forgotten family God knows exactly where you are and God knows exactly when to send the Lord into your life Jesus comes directly to Thomas he could have gone to the rest of them but he comes to the one who's had the spiritual trauma and that is Thomas. He comes to Thomas and he addresses Thomas. He doesn't address anybody else. When you are willing to remove your roadblock, come and guess what will happen? God will address you and not everybody else. Now I got to be honest here. Sometimes in life, we can see God through Christ Jesus address everybody else at the table, but us. We can see God give a breakthrough to everybody else but us. We can see God heal everybody else's marriage and ours lays on the floor of ruin. We can see God get everybody else's child together, get them in the college, get them off of drugs, get them out of their wrong mind into their right mind. We can see God heal everybody else's family and deliver everybody else's loved one. But ours sits in a wasteland. Do I have a witness here? And we wonder, and I've come to tell you that God through Christ goes directly to Thomas. And what makes him go to Thomas is that Thomas has been honest about what he needed. He told the disciples earlier, I ain't believing unless I see for myself. In essence, stop holding what hurts you in. Let it out. Let somebody know, let the close-knit family friendship know that I'm wounded and I need the Lord to come fix it. I wished I had a witness. I wished I had someone that would stop having people to think what's wrong with them and tell them what's wrong with them. The text says that he comes directly to Thomas and he says to Thomas, put your hand right here. I want you to know that the Lord doesn't need anybody to tell him what you need, he knows before you even say it. He said to Thomas, put your hand here. Thomas has already announced it to the crowd, but the Lord knew exactly where it was. Building our faith after the resurrection, we must remove the roadblocks so the Lord will get there. I want you to know something. In the Gospel of John, resurrection is more than a doctrine. Resurrection is more than what leads to salvation. Resurrection is more than what gives you a gift to eternal life. Resurrection is relationship. And I've got to be honest, some things are not going to be fixed in our life until the roadblocks in relationships are removed. Can I testify that that may be what God is up to right now? We're in the midst of a sixth week of not being able to, to be with one another in the presence of a sanctuary. We're in the midst of possibly even longer of a viral infection that has claimed the lives of people we don't know and possibly some that we do. We've heard the stories of people recovering, but it's not enough. Can I announce to you that maybe what God is doing in this coronavirus experience, or this coronavirus experience, this COVID-19 moment, is that God is removing roadblocks that we have placed in front of people. He is not allowing this to just affect Democrats. God is not allowing this to just affect Republicans or independents. God is strategically allowing this virus to affect all of humanity. And every now and then when God is ready to move in humanity, he will not allow it to affect just one race, one creed, one color, one ethnic boundary, one Democratic or Republican party, one political tie. God allows it to take over the whole race of humanity and possibly, just possibly, 
God can be removing roadblocks through this virus. What do you mean? Everybody needs a vaccine, not just Republicans, not just blacks and whites, not just Hispanics, not just minorities, not just brown and black people, but everybody, not just teachers and students, not just business leaders, but everybody, everybody is affected. And even those who attempted to make sure that the rich got richer right now, it's hitting them too. And as a matter of fact, some of us assumed that it was a rich person's disease, but we found out that it's everybody's disease. God will remove the roadblocks that humanity puts in place just so Jesus can get to him. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that when I remove my roadblock, God increases and strengthens and builds my faith. There's one more thing I want to share and I'm going to get out your head this morning. The last thing that I want you to know is that once roadblocks are removed, here is something that we must do to build our faith. We've got family. We've got to do what Thomas does in the text. Thomas returns to God. He wasn't with them before when Jesus showed up, but now he's with them. Eight days after being missing in action, after MIA, eight days after being ghost, Thomas shows up. And when Thomas shows up, God is waiting on him. Can I testify that family, what God really is looking for us to do is to return to him. The word says that when Thomas is with the crowd of disciples, the Lord shows up and addresses Thomas. Thomas came back to God. Building our faith after the resurrection means that we've got to return back to our God. And that shouts me because what that means is that God is able to welcome me. I don't know about you, but I'm excited that no matter how bad I've been, no matter how much I've messed up in my life, that God God has the ability to welcome me home. Is there anybody in this listening audience? Is there anybody right now hearing me talk and preach? Is there anybody right now that can testify with me out there that you have messed up so bad, that you've been through so much, that you've had to been, you've been down so deep? that you didn't think that God could resurrect you, that you didn't think that God could make a bridge for you to come back to him. As a matter of fact, you didn't think that God wanted you back. Well, I've come to announce that you are in good company because Peter lied and said he didn't know Jesus. Thomas walks away from Jesus. You and I have denied him by not acting like a Christian all the time. But the Lord welcomed Peter. The Lord welcomes Thomas. The Lord welcomes the disciples and God will welcome you. I didn't mean here. I didn't mean to go here. I really didn't. But my soul getting happy because when I think of the miracles in the gospel of John, it reminds me that every miracle that the Lord performed. The Lord had to have the person return to him. It didn't matter if he went to them. They came back to the Lord. The, the, the road was rough and the going was tough and the hills were hard to climb, but they made their way. They pressed their way. They overcame some difficulties. They removed roadblocks and God made a way for them. I've come to announce to you and to testify my Myself, uh, that when you decide to return to God, I mean, get back to him. He has a way uh, of making your faith sufficient uh, for the struggles you're in right now. Uh, faith uh, can make the difference. Love through faith uh, will make a way out of no way. Yes. This morning, I want to remind you that building our faith after the resurrection is simple. It's simple. How do we do it? You know the story. First, what? We, re we remain relational. We've got to stay relational even in these moments. Secondly, family, we've got to remove the roadblocks that our spiritual trauma and our physical pain has placed trying to protect us from getting hurt again. You've got to remove those roadblocks.
family. And you might say, Pastor, that's not in the text. Yes, it is. They closed the doors to keep people out. When you close doors, you also close doors to the potential that God can get to you. And here we go. Remove your roadblock and then return to God. You know what? You've got time to get your first outfit together for the first worship experience that you are going to attend when this gets to a place where we can attend worship in a sanctuary of the living God again. Get your, get your outfit ready. Order something new. You ain't doing nothing at home. Order it online new. Get, get, get yourself together to return to God. And God is waiting for you. That's my time today. I pray that you've been blessed. I pray that something in this moment that God shared with you through me, blessed you, strengthened you, made a difference in you. I've got two questions. One, I need to ask you, do you have a church home? Let me ask you this. Do you have a virtual church home? If you don't have a virtual church home, I would love for you to become a member of the virtual St. John Church in Columbus. I'd love to be your virtual pastor. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to, to share with you. I'd love to have you with me every Sunday. And you can do that. You can do that by letting me know. You can do that by joining us on the YouTube channel that we have for you. Our videos are documented and placed on the YouTube channel and you can join us the same way. Won't you join our virtual church? Become a member. We will bless you. We'll pray for you and we will encourage you through this pandemic experience. And guess what? When the time comes, I'll look to see you in person. Be encouraged and God bless you.